and putting on this really important conference um, and to Mel, to Sam and Eleanor on the panel and everyone else who is here to be part of this discussion we are undertaking together. And of course, big thank you to the incredible BSL team and I'll be trying to do uh, my best to speak as slow as my nerves will allow me to. Um, I'm a member of the London Mining Network. Um, as I just said, and this afternoon I'm going to share some of the arguments of the Marshall Mining Report that we published in November and some questions about what implications this may have for real human security and what that looks like. And what I'm about to share about the interdependent relationship between the industries of war and mining is not novel um, or theoretical to the communities that London Mining Network members organize in solidarity with from South Africa to the Philippines to West Papua um, to Brazil. On the contrary, it is through the resistance of anti-colonial and anti-capitalist movements across the global south and by diaspora and indigenous communities in the global north that I came to an understanding of this critical juncture in planetary history as symptoms of a capitalist system that is structured by empire and colonialism. And this system, as we know, distributes the violent impacts of these crises and access to security within them differentially across lines of race, class, gender, disability, sexuality, immigration status, and other structures of oppression. And we've already heard Sam and Mel mention a lot of those. So these overlapping health, climate, and ecological crises have exposed our shared vulnerability as well as amplified these divisions. Um, like the arms industry, um, the mining industry and companies have used the pandemic um, to reclassify or to classify themselves as essential to public interest and national security. And they've been continuing and expanding their operations despite mass outbreaks and deaths among workers and mining affected communities. We've also seen Anglo-American, which is one of the biggest companies based in London, submit over 300 applications um, uh, during the pandemic to explore for gold and other minerals in the Amazon, including indigenous territories. And London Mining Network was part a signatory to an open letter with 330 organizations that the health of indigenous peoples, workers and social movements must come before the profits of mining corporations. And it is no accident that at this juncture, the Ministry of Defence is procuring up to 350 billion pounds worth of nuclear submarines, robotic weapons, aircraft carriers, space satellites. And like many others, I believe here um, that we can see sort of the emerging eco-fascist response to climate collapse and widespread social unrest because London, as we know, has been a, is a hub for the arms and security industries, but also for fossil fuels, metals and minerals, and has been for a long time a global capital for organized, though often legalized, violence against people and nature. And from our perspective at London Mining Network, we focus on companies like Rio Tinto, Anglo American, Glencore and BHP, which are at the base of global supply chains, including for the military. And one of the key arguments in the report is that militarism is more than a diversion of funds from the health of people and nature towards warfare, but militarism is itself an essential ingredient that is fueling the climate and ecological crises. So I think with Marshall Mining, what has challenged me in the process is to extend this idea of It Starts Here, which is the name of this conference, and to extend that from the arms fairs that occur before the war zones of Afghanistan and Pakistan and Somalia and Yemen and Mali, to the mines that happen before the smelters, the ship and the factories where these weapons are being made. And I think it challenges us to see these as connected um, geographies of violence 
where insecurity is produced and sustained through various forms of warfare. So before being transformed into smartphones or into electric vehicles and wind turbines, or even technologies of violence and war, the extraction of cobalt in the Congo, of platinum in South Africa, of lithium in Bolivia, of copper in Mongolia, and gold in West Papua is already occurring in the context of militarized displacement, occupations of communities, resource extraction, and labor exploitation. And what the report does is draw attention to the vast quantities of natural resources that are required to assemble the weapons for war, for borders, for surveillance, and for security. And to remind ourselves that every ton of minerals that is extracted leaves even larger volumes of toxic waste in its wake that poisons soils, waters, and air all over the world. So if we take, for example, the government announcement this week, which has been mentioned to increase the nuclear weapons stockpile, we have to put this in the context of Britain's nuclear weapons, which is intimately tied to the Rossing uranium mine in Namibia, which was operated by Rio Tinto during apartheid occupation, in a similar way to how the atrocities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki are tied to the uranium mine of Shinkolobwe in the Congo under Belgian colonialism. And today, much uranium mining still happens on Aboriginal lands in Australia by Rio Tinto, an Anglo-Australian company. And I think here we can see the links between the destruction of ecosystems and habitats, which we could call ecocides, as well as the destruction of communities and cultures, which we could call genocide. Um, so another connection that we wanted to highlight here is the significant overlap between countries that the UK sells arms to or provides police and military trainings for and the countries where UK mining companies and fossil fuel companies are extracting resources. And the Ministry of Defence is explicit that being one of the world's largest exporters of arms and security equipment helps to assure the UK's access to these resources. And this um, trade in arms and in training and in counterinsurgency is not disconnected from the intimidation, the surveillance, the harassment, the forced disappearances, and the assassinations that communities resisting mining experience on a day-to-day -day basis. So to draw all of these together, or this reality um, where spaces of violent insecurity are produced as sacrifice zones in the pursuit of national or imperial security. I'm coming into this panel with a lot more questions than answers about what real human security means or looks like. So I'm looking forward to the discussion where we think about this. I know that many London Mining Network partner organizations um, advocate transformative alternatives under the yes to life and no to mining campaigns which emphasize indigenous sovereignty and land rights and the rights of nature. I also want us to ask ourselves um, whether it is possible um, to reclaim the discourse of security and to think about who this discourse is for and whose interest it serves to ask ourselves whether it may be irretrievably rooted in colonial military and capitalist grammar, to ask ourselves whether it commands us towards order and the destructive attempts to securitize what is inherently ungovernable um, from the Earth's ecological systems to the patterns of human and non-human animal migrations, or does it command us towards justice and solidarity as we've heard from Mel and Sam and others and how expansive can we Im imagine these words and verbs to be and feel like? So I look forward to discussing that. Thank you.